well, it's a uh, time for a case study. The objective of uh, this activity is to review a case that you would typically see in your daily clinical practice and uh, see how uh, spinal uh, the analysis of sagittal balance might make an impact in your surgical decision making. So please remember to open your mobile device and go to paulev.com and enter this code so we can uh, answer some of the interactive questions. Thank you. All right. So um, this is a case of a 54-year-old female. She has a, a clinical history of one year of axial lumbar pain irradiated to the back and side of the lower limbs, both sides. The pain typically incre increases with changes in position, especially, specifically lateral bending and extension movements. She has neurogenic claudication at 10 meters, and she has an inadequate response to oral analgesics, including opioids, opioid medication. <clears throat> of note, she reported increased pain during physical activity. On neurolog neurological examination, she had a localized back pain in the lumbosacral junction, bilateral L5 and S1 relicular pain and hypesthesia with no um, allodynia, and a left uh, four out of five uh, paresis for dorsal flexion. This is the basic lumbar x ray. So here we can see that the patient uh, presents with a L5 S1 spondy, RAID 1 spondy, 6.6 .6 degrees, 8.7 millimeters. So dynamic flexion extension x-rays are done to evaluate the, the degree of uh, instability. And we can see that there's a uh, angular, both angular and uh, translational movement, especially angular movement in L5 S1. On MRI, this is center, this is left, this is right. You can see that the central spinal canal is quite wide, but at the foramenal level, there's significant foramenal stenosis and spinal root compression on both sides. This is in lieu with uh, the L5 paresis. At the L4, L5 spinal level of note, you can see that there's significant facetary inflammatory changes, and there are some already incipient uh, changes in the L4, L5 disc. And this in, in part is in relationship with the uh, lumbar pain. At L4, L4, L5 in the axial um, MRI, you can see that the central canal was open as we saw in the sagittal plane, but the both foramens are completely occluded due to disc bulging. So this is our uh, full body X-ray. We have, this is the sagittal profile. We have a pelvic tilt of 28.4, a pelvic incidence of 72 degrees, a global, a global lumbar lordosis of 65 degrees, and an SVA of minus 10.3 millimeters. So as you can see, there's a significantly uh, increased pelvic tilt. So according to uh, the sagittal profile, uh, what would you say, or uh, what would you be your opinion? What type of sagittal profile would this correspond to? type one, a type two, a type three, a type three antiverted, or a type four? Uh, please take two minutes to answer the, the question. All right, let's see the responses. So we have type two, 15%, type three, 30%, antiverted type three, 
type one and type four temperance in each. So let's evaluate all these possibilities. First of all, we're evaluating the sagittal profile that the patient currently has, not what she should have, right? So first parameters we have to take into account, sacral slope. How much is the sacral slope? It's 43.6 degrees. So that will take us already into one of three profiles, either be a type three, a type four, or a type three antibody. So next in line, what should we do? Well, to distinguish a type three from a type three antivir, the pelvic tilt is gonna be the guideline. If you have an increased pelvic tilt, then it's gonna be either a type three or type four, which probably is telling you that there's a compensation mechanism going on. In a type three antiverted, you would have either a very low pelvic tilt, close to zero, or even a negative pelvic tilt. So that would exclude the antiverted type three. So in this case, we're talking either a type three or a type four pelvic curvature of sagittal profile. So what uh, information will tell us if it's either a type three or a type four? Basically, two things will tell you uh, or guide you towards this decision. Now that we know that there's a pelvic, uh, uh, a high slack slope. One of them will be the pelvic incidence. Uh, the higher the pelvic incidence, the more probably it should be a type four, but not the current state. The higher the slope, the more probable it is a type four. Um, secondly, the inflection point of the thoracolumbar spine. In this case, uh, the inflection point is down over here, close to the L1. The higher it is, the more probable it is that it is a type four. And the apex of the lumbar lordosis. In this case, the apex of the lumbar lordosis is on the upper portion of the L4 vertebral body. And this is more in line with the more symmetric uh, curvature, which is more in line with the type three. So the correct answer with the uh, Rusoli type three at the current state. Okay, let's go for the next question. So with respect to the relationship between the pelvic incidence and the lumbar lower doses, what do you think? Is this lumbar lower doses inadequate for this patient? Is this, it does the, the, the lumbar lordosis, should it be calculated using the Schwab's formula, which you can see on the left? Or maybe should we use the Wex formula, which is also on the left? Please take a couple of minutes to answer your question. Okay, so two groups of answers. It should be calculated to Schwab's or Lewex. And this is what happens every day. In a way, this is a kind of a trick question because the first answer is dependent on the other two. So this is what is uh, the situation is up to now because definitely the relate, there is a mathematical relationship between incidence and lumbar lordosis but that's depending on ethnicity, the studies you have done, or the population you're studying, and age. So probably with time, we're gonna have, probably end up with a table uh, with respect to age and the relationships, and probably even ethnicity or population. Um, but at the moment, uh, the study, what the study has shown is for most cases, the lumbar lordosis, when the, when the um, 
pelvic incidence is below 50 degrees, Schwab, Schwab's formula, which is easier to bear in mind, is a good approximation. The problem is that there's a pretty big range, plus or minus nine or 10 degrees from uh, the degree of uh, pelvic incidence. So it's quite a big range. But definitely when the incidence goes above 70 degrees, then the precision of Schwab's, of Schwab's formula is not that good. So in those cases, uh, it is better to actually use Lewex and the interval is around five uh, degrees more or less. So in this case, where you have a pelvic incidence of 72 degrees, it would be a bit wiser to use the information that the Wex formula would give us versus Schwab's. But if you, if you look at the answers on the left, actually the answer of the Wex formula is within the range of Schwab's formula. So these are approximations and they'll guide you, but there's never gonna be an exact answer. So you're always gonna have to evaluate the situation. Now, with respect with this, to this information, if the patient has 65 degrees lumbar lordosis and by Lewex formula has 63, 66 degrees and by Schwab 61 to 81, then we could say that it's more or less adequate, right? So the answer would basically be uh, in this ideal situation, maybe the Lewex formula would be best, but as you can see, it is acceptable to use Schwab's formula taking into account that you're gonna have a larger uh, range of values to consider. And in this case, maybe the Lewex formula would be more precise. Going to our next question. So according to Dr. Barry's classification of a balanced, balanced but compensated spine and unbalanced spine, what would you consider the situation to be? Is this patient in a normal uh, state of balance? Everything's fine. Is this a compensated state of balance? So it's compensated, but there's actually mechanisms going on to ensure that this is happening, or definitely it's out of balance and uh, the situation is pretty severe. Please take two minutes to answer. Very well. So 71%, the spine is in compensated balance and the spine is unbalanced at 29%. So how do we know in which situation we are? Well, right now we've already established that it's in a type three, in the type three uh, uh, sagittal profile. So the next question is, what should that spinal profile be if there was nothing going on? And for this, the pelvic incidence might be a good guideline. If you have a, pa a patient with a pelvic incidence that is below 50 degrees, that means that that patient most surely does not have a very large lumbar low doses. In this case, it is most probable that that patient originally in a balanced state when they were young, they had a type one or a, two, a type two sagittal profile. If the pelvic incidence is high above 50 degrees, then it would be expected that the patient in a normal balanced state would have either a type three, a type three introverted, or a type four sagittal profile. So with this information in mind, you could say that, and the other thing is that the pelvic tilt, if you have a normal pelvic tilt, the most probable situation is balance. If you have a severely negative or a zero or close to zero or negative sagittal balance, as a pelvic tilt, sorry, you're gonna either be in a type three introverted spine, which would be normal, or you would have a balanced state, which would be normal as well. If you have an increased pelvic tilt, then you know that at least one mechanism is going on, and that is pelvic retroversion. So in this case, the patient has a 28 degree uh, pelvic tilt. 
which is, and she's not of extreme old age. She's 56 years old. As old, the older you get, the more towards 20, the, you tend to drift in your pelvic tilt as a normal reaction to spinal degeneration. So in this, with this information in mind, you could confidently say that this patient is in a compensated balanced state. Another key to that is that she actually has a listhesis. And that listhesis is probably a compensation mechanism because due to the L5S1 dystasis, the overstress to try to generate lordosis in that segment led to over, overloading of the L5S1 posterior elements and eventually to failure and slippage as a mechanism to compensate for the loss of lordosis. So in this case, even though she has an important lumbar lordosis, which if we didn't take any of this information into account, would say that it's a healthy, big, nice lumbar lordosis, probably for this patient, even though right now the lordosis is fine, segmentally, there's a problem of kyphosing event in L5 S1 especially. So that's something to take into account. So based on the previous question, again, what would be the normal non-degenerated spinal motor type that we should expect for this patient, a type one or two or a type three or four? Please take a minute to answer the question. Okay, so as we saw in the previous question, remember, how do we know how things should have been? We can have a very good idea based on the pelvic incidence. For pelvic incidences below 50 degrees, you're probably gonna be in a situation of being a type one, a type two, or a type three antiverted. For a pelvic incidence of more than 50 degrees, it's gonna be probably a type three or a type four. This is trying to view the, the past from the present, but it's gonna give you an idea. The second the point, point of information is the state of the pelvic tilt. The pelvic tilt was, is gonna tell you if how much retroversion is gonna be used by the patient. So if it's normal or negative, it's gonna be balanced and probably type three or an antiverted type three. If the pelvic incidence is higher, that means it's probably using retroversion. So it's probably tend more to be a higher grade, three or four type of morphotype. And uh, another way of knowing if, there's an, if there isn't a very big change in the rest of the curvature would be the inflection point. But sometimes that could be a little bit confusion if you have maybe a fracture or something uh, up uh, above the lumbar spine, which can change the profile. In those cases, it might be different. So the key here to try to have an idea is basically the pelvic incidence and to recognize how much retroversion is being done. With that, you can have a pretty good idea of which of these two groups the patient originally was. And this is gonna tell you or give you a good idea with respect of the objectives of surgery. And here's where the relationship between lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence can also be of use and a guideline. By looking at that relationship, if the relationship is off, that is, you have a hyperlordotic spine with respect to pelvic incidence, you know that you are compensating for a problem, you have an imbalance or a mismatch between lordosis 
And the incidence, that will probably be the case of a patient that's more degenerated with more imbalance, and probably you're going to tend to the previous situation, tend to be more of a curve on a more on the right side, a type 3 or a type 4. Or if the relationship is more, is more in line, then uh, it may be more to the left to a type 1 or type 2. But for that, you have to actually analyze the profile of the curve and the incidence. So comes the big question, and the question which is always very difficult, especially in spinal surgery, because there's no, there's never one universal solution or one right solution. Uh, what would you propose? Uh, what surgical strategy strategy would you propose? Clearly, this patient has instability, has pain, is uh, has limited function, she has claudication, and she has paresis, so she has a neurologic compromise. Uh, so we have to fix all of these problems and at the same time, try to do the surgery that hopefully will give us the best results in the long run. Um, so what are the options? Well, an open laminectomy, foraminotomy without fusion, open laminectomy and foraminotomy and open posterior fusion, maybe do an open T-lift, one or two segments, an MIS T-lift, one or two segments, Maybe let's go from the front. Let's just do an L5-S1A lift, for example, or this L4-L5-L5-S1A lift standalone, or maybe let's do the same, but combine it with an open or MIS posterior procedure, or maybe let's go with the flow and go with a newer procedure, an L5, L4-L5-L5-S1 anterior via O-lift A lift plus MIS pedicle screws. Uh, these are some of the options. Uh, probably there are much more. Uh, but what would you consider? All right. So this is interesting. This is what is to be expected. There are many options and um, we'll discuss each one of these options. But first we want to tell you uh, what goes through our mind and what went through our mind in this specific case. So we have a patient with a type three curve, which is in a compensated state. And that compensation is being done at the L5S1 disc space by listhesis. But she right, since that compensation capability has been lost up to the point that there's failure due to the thesis, now the L45 disc space is also being overloaded at the point that now we have structural damage in the facet joints and they are a pain generator. So the first thing to, to take into account would be that there's a spinal compensation, there is retroversion, and even though the spinal, the overall lordosis is okay, there is a deficit at a segment level, a functional use unit level, especially at L5-S1. But right now, the pathology is growing beyond L5-S1 and is involving L4-L5. The global balance may be okay because she's compensating. The global profile is fine, but there is a, there is a, a specific problem in the last two segments, especially in L5-S1. Second, there is neurologic compromise, so we do have to decompress, and there's instability, so do we do have to fixate or, fu or fuse the spine. So we need a solution that can do various things. First of all, we need to give the most amount of lordosis to those spinal segments that are involved, especially L5-S1. Second, we need to fuse those segments so they do not move. Third, we need to decompress the roots at L5, therefore giving an opportunity to improve the neurological symptoms. And at the same time, we have to, we want to do this in a way that we can minimize post-operative pain, surgical time, surgical bleeding. So let's discuss the options. 
Well, an open laminectomy and foraminotomy without fusion, well, the problem is that we would not be changing the lordosis and uh, we would not, we would probably be worsening the problem of, of segment instability. So that it's obviously not a, a good idea. Open laminectomy, foraminotomy and posterior fusion, that was probably the standard a few years ago. Uh, the problem with this surgery is that although we are addressing the instability and the compression, we are not doing anything about the compensatory mechanisms. So this spine, now that can, it cannot compensate at L4, L5, it's going to start compensating at L3, L4, and we're going to have eventually a spinal degeneration at that segment. And the spine, the, the problem is going to go up and up and up. So if you try to read the future, which is very, very difficult, you're probably not going to have problems in the short run, but you are going to have problems in the long run. An open T-lift procedure, excellent for restoring this height, excellent for fixation, excellent for fusion, either via an open or an MIS approach. What's, what is the problem then? Why not an open T-lift or an MIS T-lift? Well, unless you have expandable cages, it is very difficult to obtain a lower dosing effect above five or six degrees per segment when you do a T-lift without doing any large posterior work. So if you want to gain lordosis at L5 specifically, it's not going to be very efficient. So it would be an alternative if you just need a little bit of lordosis, but the more lordosis you need, the T-lift the T -lift or even the P-lift procedure would not be the very best choice. It would be an intermediate choice and you would not get the lordosing effect that you probably want. And by reducing the least thesis, you would actually be shifting the gravity, the C7 plumb line. So what about an ALIF? Well, an ALIF is a very good option. You can treat the lordosis, you can give as much lordosis as you want, but you cannot do it standalone because you have frank instability at the L5S1 level. So you do need a posterior fusion. So in this case, we opted for an MIS approach with an anterior instrumentation followed by posterior fusion. In this case, an L45, L5, S1, OLIF, which is which a good alternative would be also an L45, L5, L5, S1, OLIF, uh, ALIF plus MIS fusion. With this in mind, we can restore lordosis, reduce lordosis, do a minimum, do a indirect decompression of the segments taking into account the compression was due to disc prolapse and foraminal stenosis associated with the thesis and the disc especially. So these two problems can be solved indirectly. And through posterior fusion, we can obtain fixation, adequate fixation. So what were the, what were the results? Well, these are the pre-op and post-op images. So what would we expect? Should we see great big changes in sagittal profile? Well, not really, not very much. We're not trying to change the sagittal profile. For that, we need to do quite big osteotomies. But we do want to reduce the thesis and not uh, make it worse by not, change, by not giving your doses. So the, at L5S1, we passed, we went from nine degrees of lordosis to 15 degrees of lordosis. So we, we were able to gain lordosis at the L5S1 disc space. We fixated the L45 disc space and gained some lordosis in that level as well in a way to treat the pain generated by the facet joint at the L45 level. And we were able to revert some of the compensating mechanisms. How do we know that? We know that because we can see that the pelvic tilt improved. And you do not need huge improvements for that to be actually clinically effective. So we can see that the pelvic tilt changed for 28.4, practically 29 to 24 degrees. It looks small on the numbers, but if you look at the sagittal profile of the spine, you can see that there's actually a shift in the overall profile of the curvature where it's now more symmetric. The curve of the lumbar spine is more symmetric to that of the thoracic spine. And this patient, uh, actually improved quite a bit in our muscular pain and uh, the sporesis was solved within five, three or four days. And due to the MIS approach, she was actively walking on the next day. So this, this is one possible solution. 
And this is one of the reasons why, if you understand the concepts, why is it that so many anterior procedures are being done now? Why so much x lift? Why so much o lift? What? Why so much a lift? Well, it's a very good way to try to reverse the degenerative uh, process of hypolordosis without doing big osteotomies on the spine and try to improve part of the balance, trying to operate on the fewest amount of spinal segments possible. And nowadays with MIS techniques, we can do even these combined approaches with little, with a very low blood loss, low postoperative time, and especially a very good or short recovery for the patient. So this is a good alternative, uh, a good way of thinking. It is not obviously, it's impossible to predict the future and only the years to come will tell us if this decision was the right decision. But we do think that by analyzing, analyzing balance and having a good idea of what's happening biomechanically, we can try to give the patient the best chance of a good post-op uh, outcome in the long run. So uh, we are now open for your questions. Well, Dr. Torres, Dr. Torres and Dr. Laverde, thank you very much for your illustrative case. So uh, for the audience, please remember to type right your questions in the Q&A panel if there is someone. So Dr. Yasser Abdullah is writing, I can see here there is mismatch postoperative of PILL. Okay, so uh, I thought that there was most to the question. So yes, uh, when you measure the, the measurements that are on the right are using Schwab's formula, not uh, Lewex formula. Remember that the balance has to be evaluated as a whole and each of these uh, data are snippets of a bigger picture. So what, the, what you want to improve is not just one parameter. You want to improve the global situation. And in this case, one of the, uh, the key data points is the tilt and the position and the global profile of the spine. If you look at the pelvic, uh, if the lumbar lordosis, it might have just gone down a little bit. But, in, but that patient had, had, was using the thesis as a way of gaining abnormal lordosis. So we were able to gain lordosis, maybe not as much. We, we were, it would have been nice if maybe we, we were being able to uh, get a bigger implant. Uh, we do have a little bit of a limitation. We used a 20 degree L5S1 implant, but uh, the L4, L5 implant was limited to 10 degrees because we did not have uh, a more angulated implant available. Um, so if we would have had a better, a, a bigger or a more angulated implant for L4, L5, for example, uh, you could have gone for the alternatives and gain even more lordosis. We could have used just use a 50 degree knee implant, or even if you wanted even more, you could have done uh, uh, an incision on the anterior ligament and used a larger implant, but we did not have that kind of implant available. So it is, it's gonna be a compromise depending on what you have available. If we wanted to get more lordosis without a, a more angulated anterior implant, then we would have had to do a much bigger uh, surgery on the back. So we would have to do some kind of osteotomy, either beyond the facet joints probably, and then do compression, and that would make a much larger surgery. So it's, it's one of the problems that you're always gonna have. Not always you have every single uh, tool you want available with respect to implants, and you do not want to go overboard trying to correct perfectly as possible, and then having to make the surgery bigger and getting more morbidity more surgical time and uh, more complications uh, in relation to the bigger or uh, the larger size of, the, of your surgery. So those were the, some of the limitations that we had in this particular case. And I, get, I think um, many of you, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, 
see this kind of problem in, in, uh, usually. But I think the, uh, the general objective of reducing the compensatory mechanism in this patient uh, was achieved. Okay, thank you. The next question said, what is the timing to evaluate postoperative x-rays? That is actually an excellent question with respect to balance. Uh, you should always take, if possible, a full body x-ray after surgery as soon as the patient is standing, but at least to be get the, to, to know your overall results, at least one month should go by because you do need the patient to actually start walking and get used to his new position and for the spine to take its new balance or, or obtain its new balance. And that's gonna change the, the profile of the spine. And you usually, you, you, you do see this. In some occasions, and something that uh, we sometimes do, in cases where we have to, we can do an anterior surgery and then we have to do a posterior fixation. Uh, and maybe we don't have instability like in this case. Sometimes we'll do the anterior surgery first and then wait. 20 days or 30 days, do you want a, a new spinal x-ray and then plan the posterior fusion? Because sometimes, uh, in, in you, you, and you tend to see that, is you do the, the anterior procedure, you take a post-op x-ray, but then one month later, you do another full body x-ray and, and the profile is even better than it was before. So if you take into account this kind of situation, and sometimes it's better to wait between the first and, or the anterior procedure and the posterior procedure, because then the patient will actually help you gain more lord doses, and then you won't have to do much, uh, so much work uh, on the second procedure. At the same time, you could think it otherwise, like uh, if I fix it, I, I do a posterior fixation in the first surgical OR time, I might be restriction, restricting what the patient could have obtained if I were a little bit more patient. So I would say a month would be uh, more or less um, a good idea to have a, a nice uh, overview of, of how the final situation was. Thank you, doctor. Next question is, I see on postoperative images that SVA decreased, but also lumbar lord doses decreased as well. How can you explain this phenomenon? Yes. Uh, as I talked in the two questions before, L5S1 was failed because of overload of the posterior elements. The, the shear, the, the listhesis, also shifts the L5S1, the C7 plus 9. So to compensate this, you would have to give much bigger lower doses to the lower two segmental levels. By giving lower doses, you're going to shift backwards the C7 plumb line, and you're going to give more lower doses. If we were, we, if we would have been able to get more lumbar lower doses out of the anterior implants, we were limited because of the size of the implants. We probably would have gained that little bit more of lower doses and uh, centered even more the C7 plumb line. So the take home message about this is it's going to be very rare the occasion where you're gonna get a mathematical precise one-on-one. -on -one. You're gonna to have to uh, evaluate your results based on a broader view. And in this case, if you, you can see, and it's all quite evident in both uh, the left and the right image, the profile changed and the tilt improved. And the tilt is, is the mathematical or the numerical way that the patient is telling us that the pelvic retrovation changed. Although in part, that is also um, generated by the change in the L5-S1 disc. So this is what the, the is showing us. She is, she is not in a perfect balance state, but she has a reduced compensation due to surgery. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to reduce as much as possible the amount of compensation required. It is not usually necessary to take the patient into a perfectly balanced state like she was 20 years old. And usually what that uh, does, if you try to think like that, 
is that um, you will actually tend to overcorrect, and that has its own bag of problems. So you do have to have an intermediate, you have to have a, a, a more realizable goal. And that's the reason why you'd have a relatively lower lordosis, but since she does not have a slip now, the, that impact is, uh, you're changing the, the listhesis with lordosis. So you're, you're changing one thing for the other. Now she does no listhesis, but that changing, that shift is done by the lordosis gain, gain uh, locally, but globally, you're going to have a relatively lower change because it's all inter interconnected one with the other. Okay, wonderful. Next question is, would a type 3 posterior column osteotomy have been necessary for increasing more the lumbar lordosis? Interesting question. Um, yes, we could have. you can gain uh, huge amounts of lumbar lordosis uh, with a type 3 osteotomy. Um, you can gain 30, 40 degrees uh, without a problem. But the thing is, is, as I stated earlier, you want to get the best result with the smallest intervention as possible. And it is not ideal to take the patient to uh, like they were in their 20s, as I said previously. Uh, what would be the price for the patient, the biological and the surgical cost for doing this type of procedure in this patient? Well, uh, the bleeding would be much higher. The risk of neurological compromise would be very high. The risk of a dural tear would be high. Uh, we could not, if, if we did the osteomatomy, you'd have to now have a larger instrumentation. You'd have to go two levels above, two levels below. And there, then you would have to also uh, make a much bigger surgery. And you would probably, yes, you might get um, 10, 50 degrees more. But does those 10, 50 degrees more uh, of lordosis and uh, maybe five degrees of tilt more and uh, five millimeters of, FDA, of SVA, is it worth the price of doing such a huge surgery and maybe having a huge complication? Is that ideal? So that question is very important because it stresses uh, one of the key points in sagittal balance analysis. The analysis gives you an idea of the situation, gives you an overview, and gives you a good idea of maybe what you should do. But how much to do is yet to be determined. And definitely, you're always going to be in a gray area. You want to keep the patient in a compensated balanced state with as little compensation as can be achievable through surgery, but without going overboard and generating more complications than the disbalance or the imbalance is actually creating. So it's always going to be a balance and it's going to be much dependent on the physical activity of the patient, the condition of the patient and the age of the patient. So these uh, mismatches and the tilt and all these indices should be taken uh, into account depending on the age of the patient. It's not the same for a 20 year old than a 65 year old. The 65-year-old, a tilt of 20, 22 is fine. If you had 30 before, you should be grateful that you got 22 degrees of pelvic tilt. You, you actually did a pretty good job. But if you have a 20-year-old and maybe the, the situation is due to a fracture or something, maybe you do want to get that below 20 degrees in a younger patient because in the future with the gener degeneration, that's going to have a big impact. You're limiting... Um, the amount of uh, degeneration that can, that patient can tolerate it's because they're get, all the me compensatory mechanisms in the area of the spine that you're operating on are going to be nullified. So it's different uh, depending on the patient. Okay, thank you for your answer, doctor. And uh, the last question of this session is, what is the expected time for fusion of those segments? Would you do a CT scan earlier than three months? I, I usually use three months. Um, I think the uh, it's it's just the right amount of time. I usually do a post-op CT scan at three months uh, to evaluate spinal fusion. If you use um, BMP, then I would probably take it down a month or two um, because fusion is usually achieved much earlier. Or if you have a very young patient, 
a very, very young patient tend to, tends to have an earlier fusion than an older one. But three months is, is our standard. Well, thank you, Dr. Torres. So, um, Dr. Laverde and Dr. Torres, thank you very much for your intervention. Thank you very much for all the knowledge that you have shared with us in this pre-Congress course of the 2021 IWBNC.